In the, the case we just discussed, one could make the argument that continuation of a protosome inhibitor uh, remains an important aspect of the therapy. Uh, the T1416 is only a very small subset of myeloma patients. It's about 5% of all cases. But it remains one of the most challenging uh, subsets of, of this population. Uh, and uh, we have learned that, for, for instance, for the 414, continuation of protosome inhibitors results in a significant improvements in, in survival of patients, so much so that under some classifications is no longer considered a high-risk marker. Now, we know less about the 1416, but what one could postulate that given what we know for the 414, one may want to consider a continuation of a protosome inhibitor in a 1416 patient. Um, we need to develop uh, additional clinical trials and targets for the 1416. Uh, one of the things we know, and this probably drives a bad outcome, is that this subtype has the highest rate of mutation. So when you look at all myelomas, uh, particularly through the COMPASS data, we have learned that the 1416 have the highest rate of mutations, which probably means they have the highest rate of neoantigens. And I know we're in a pause right now, but the idea of immunotherapy, such as checkpoint inhibitors, I think seems pretty appealing for this patient population, or maybe being early adopters of CAR T-cell therapies or the like. The way I interpret the, the data about the efficacy of uh, proteasome inhibitors is that if you look at them together, that carfilzomib uh, gives you the best responses and the deepest responses and has uh, the best side effect profile. Um, in this patient that's already seen um, Valcade, it's a perfectly reasonable uh, option to go for a combination containing carfilzomib, it's also reasonable to expect that that patient will do at least as well as on VRD, but probably better because of the trial data supporting the efficacy of that combination. Even though this patient has seen a proteasome inhibitor before, proteasome inhibition is one of the backbones of the therapy of, of multiple myeloma. And so even though we have a range of different drugs, it is quite clear that proteasome inhibitors and imid drugs and transplantation constitute the mainstays of treatment and carfilzomib is a very excellent proteasome inhibitor. In this young patient with high-risk disease that received RVD as induction therapy followed by an autologous transplant and maintenance, once they develop relapse you have to select a therapy at relapse. Uh, this patient was started on carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexmethasone, or KRD, for their relapse disease. I think that's an excellent strategy for relapse in this, in, in this setting. This is a patient that has had first relapse. Um, there is data from the ASPIRE trial, which is updated at ASH 2017, that shows patients that had KRD for relapse, especially as their first relapse, had the best progression-free survival and had the best overall survival advantage when selecting KRD as, it's, as the, the therapy for the first relapse. So in this patient, I think it's a perfect uh, strategy for this patient. And so the ASPIRE trial was a um, randomized trial where patients were randomized to receive either a triplet, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, or KRD, versus a doublet, um, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, in uh, patients experiencing experiencing first to third relapse, so one to three prior lines of therapy. Um, in this study, um, we had an initial publication in New England Journal which showed a progression-free survival advantage to those getting KRD. In fact, at that time, the PFS was 26 months. That was the longest progression-free survival ever published as a relapse therapy in patients with multiple myeloma. Now that data was updated at ASH in 2017, and the update of the data showed that, in fact, now there's actually a survival advantage to choosing KRD versus RD as initial therapy for relapse disease. And it's pretty remarkable that they saw an overall survival advantage. The overall survival is 48 months for those getting KRD and 40 months for those getting RD. Now again, the overall survival advantage was even greater if you chose KRD as being your first primary therapy. And the advantage was more in the 11 and a half to 12 month range. So really quite a bit advantage for choosing KRD as the first relapse therapy. One question that one could pose is, should we switch to something different like pomalidomide instead of lenalidomide? 
And that's a very, very important question. I, from, from what we know, pomalidomide is able to rescue situations where lenalidomide was already showing um, uh, lack of activity. Now, we have learned recently that the activity of imids, um, as I've mentioned previously, is not an all or nothing phenomena. And uh, there's multiple mechanisms through which imids work. Uh, my lab has been involved in some of this, this work, and, and we think it's almost like you reach a threshold of pressure on the cell. Um, in our case, we think that's through oxidative stress. And you can reach a certain threshold, but it's just not quite enough to un induce apoptosis. And that's why sometimes, for instance, you may have someone who is refractory to LEN, uh, then is refractory to a PI, you combine it, and then you can push that cell over that limit. Well, the same would be true with pomalidomide. The reason the question is critical is because in that case, you want to make sure that you still have uh, that drug to be used later in the case that the lenalidomide would still be effective. And if I was uh, to say something that I think we need to work on uh, quite urgently are biomarkers that would tell us whether each one of these drugs is working individually. Um, you could imagine a situation where someone is going to be proposed uh, regimens such as KRD, and uh, that person could respond very nicely, but without a biomarker, you don't know if it was a KRD or the KD. And if that was the case, then that arm may just add toxicity and cost to the regimen. And potentially in some of these patients, we would know that the R doesn't work, but the P works. So developing those biomarkers that will allow you to tailor your therapy better, particularly with regards to uh, resistance, would be a, a very important step forward in the care of myeloma patients.